hour on I-24 News, 60 American diplomats packed inside those buses have now left Russia. They were expelled in response to the Trump administration expelling 60 Russians who were in the United States. Plus, at least one Palestinian has been killed amidst preparations for a new round of mass protests in Gaza expected Friday. And President Trump has signed the orders that will enable up to 4,000 National Guard troops to deploy along the U.S.-Mexico border. From the I-24 News Studios in Times Square in New York, this is Crossroads with David Schuster and Tal Heinrich. Russia is urging the United Nations Security Council to take action against Great Britain over British allegations that Moscow says are unfounded. All of this involves the poisoning of a former Russian double agent on British soil. The UK has said that all evidence points to Russia, but Moscow denies that. Alan Katarsky explains. Busloads of American diplomats left Moscow today after Russia expelled them in an ongoing spat over the poisoning of a former spy and his daughter in England. <laughs> Yulia Skripal is now out of a coma and spoke by phone with a cousin. She later released a statement through British police that said, I woke up over a week ago now and I'm glad to say my strength is growing daily. The Brits say Skripal and her father, Sergei, were poisoned last month with a military-grade nerve agent and that Russia is to blame. We hear all the, let's say, stories and the uh, some kind of theories about our motivations. We don't buy it. The Russians called a special meeting of the UN Security Council to demand Britain lay out its case. The Russian uh, motive in calling for a Security Council meeting today uh, is another step in the pattern of obfuscation and contempt for international institutions. The Times of London reports British security sources traced the nerve agent to a covert lab. Those same experts said it was overwhelmingly likely to have come from Russia. That was Aaron Katarski reporting. For more, let's bring in senior diplomatic correspondent Nina Larson in Washington. Nina, what happened at the UN meeting on Russia today? Well, ironically enough, Tal, this was a meeting called by the Russians and the Russians typically playing the victim. They say that this is some kind of conspiracy against them, that other foreign intelligence agencies must have carried out this attack. And you can imagine how this went down with the UK ambassador. Let's take a listen. Allowing Russian scientists uh, into an investigation uh, when they are the most likely uh, perpetrators of the crime in Salisbury would be like Scotland Yard inviting in Professor Moriarty. And what the ambassador is referring to there in that clip, Tal, is uh, the, the casting doubt on Russia's uh, sincerity in wanting to take part in an investigation on British soil about all of this. So you can imagine uh, how the UK government's feeling about that offer. Yeah, and how's the United States feeling about the Russians essentially using the United Nations to essentially play defense by going on the offense against the UK? Well, again, David, it didn't go down too well. And we're seeing some retaliation in the wider sense against Russia uh, with some new sanctions that are going to be coming out on Friday. Um, these are not sanctions directly related to this attack. Uh, this is more about election meddling, but it's more of the same kind of pressure that we're going to be seeing from global players on Russia. Uh, this is, the two issues might not seem to be related, but it's all part of a pressure campaign. Uh, the people that will be targeted, and that announcement should come tomorrow, are oligarchs, those very elite wealthy individuals that possibly have a lot of assets on U.S. soil and U.S. related holdings, David. Mm. Anina, in the U.K., how are the victims? We saw that Yulia Skripal, her condition is getting better, but what else? That's correct. So Yulia is only 33 and she's actually rapidly improving in hospital. That's something that the perpetrators of this attack didn't, didn't uh, count on. And if, she, if she's able to come round and make some identifications, that really could be bad news for Russia. If she's able to give an eyewitness account of who carried this out and how, Russia will be under fire yet again. Nina Larson, thank you.
This is a fascinating one because, I mean, I guess the word is chutzpah. It takes chutzpah <laughs> Taking it to, to go. Taking it to the United Nations Security Council. Right, to complain about all the great British governments. <laughs> they are picking on us and claiming that we had some. Everybody says there's no disagreement that this Novichok started in Russia, this chemical. But agent. they have just the perfect timing. A day after British scientists say that they could not prove or verify the precise source of the nerve agent and, you know, indicate that it actually came from the Russian government. So well, it's perfect timing and great strategy. Right. I mean, they know that it was, it came in the sense that it was developed in Russia. The question is, was the Russian government involved in the delivery or was it somebody in the underworld or was it a former KGB person who had access to this and carried it out? And that's all stuff for intelligence agencies to figure out. But again, for Russia to complain, oh, woe is us and go to the United Nations, it's remarkable. Remarkable. Still ahead on Crossroads. Israel's military says it will not allow Hamas militants to repeat their violent demonstrations along the Gaza border. Plus, there was never a deal. Rwanda denied it agreed to resettle thousand African migrants that Israel wants out of the Jewish state. Tensions are growing between Israel and several African states in a dispute over migrants. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is blaming Rwanda for his decision to pull out of a deal relocating thousands of African migrants. But Rwanda says there was never any deal that it had with Israel to begin with. The clash is causing a lot of diplomatic headaches on several continents, and it's also keeping the migrants in Israel in limbo. Diplomatic correspondent Mike Wagenheim helps us sort it all out. A foreign enemy or the boogeyman under the bed? Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that the U.S.-based New Israel Fund is to blame for the collapse of his African migrant deportation efforts. Netanyahu ripped the left-wing NGO this week, claiming that it pressured the government of Rwanda to renege on a deal to take in the bulk of the 30,000-plus illegals from Eritrea and Sudan. The premier accused the self-proclaimed human rights and social justice organization of undermining Israel's security, stressing its foreign roots and funding sources. The new Israel fund admits it poured substantial money and energy into organizing protests in Israel against the forced deportation initiative. And two of the Israeli NGOs it supports wrote a letter to the Rwandan government imploring them not to accept any deported migrants from Israel. But... NIF itself adamantly denied to I-24 News that it applied pressure to the Rwandan government. The Prime Minister's claims against the new Israel Fund are baseless, and it's not the first time that he lashes out at us, at the media in Israel, at the judiciary, when he himself is failing to provide a deal. For its part, Rwandan foreign affairs officials swatted away Netanyahu's claims, saying they've never heard of NIF and would not have succumbed to pressure from them or any other foreign NGO anyway. So what's behind Netanyahu's rhetoric? Well, beyond NIF's protest funding, there's also a recent visit to Rwanda by a human rights lawyer, Asaf Weizen, with ties to the new Israel Fund. He met there with asylum seekers banished from Israel, though the Rwandan government turned down a meeting with him. Netanyahu and his right-wing government have also long been at odds with the New Israel Fund for its financial support of Israeli NGOs like B'Tselem and Breaking the Silence that are seen as hostile to the IDF and defenders of Palestinian terrorism. Netanyahu is also being battered by the Israeli public for his handling of the migrant crisis, and it's possible he may be looking to deflect blame. Netanyahu says he wants a parliamentary inquiry of the New Israel Fund's activities. The New Israel Fund, meanwhile, is considering legal action against Netanyahu for slander. If the Premier wanted us talking about something else, mission accomplished. The question is whether the public will blame him or the NIF for the migrant fiasco and whether the evidence makes any difference to his base, which didn't need much of a reason to dislike the new Israel fund to begin with. Mike Wagenheim, I-24 News. From the tensions over migrants between Israel and Africa to some confusion in Israel over U.S. policy towards the Middle East. And in Israel, laws, lawmakers there, they're very pleased with President Trump, but like a lot of governments around the globe, they are trying to make sense of all the Trump 
personnel moves. Specifically, they're wondering what it means for U.S. foreign policy across the Middle East. I-24 News senior Washington correspondent Dan Raviv is in Israel with the details. Having visited here in Israel in the past two weeks, I've gotten the strong impression that the government here is trying to figure out what the new Trump team will do. It's a new team in that there will be a new national security advisor in the White House, John Bolton, scheduled to take the job this coming week. And right now there is no Secretary of State, though the nominee, former Congressman Mike Pompeo, who's been CIA director for about a year, he's considered a friend of Israel, but frankly, uh, it's not known what he'll do as Secretary of State. What will he tell the president? And there are some burning issues. For instance, uh, the Palestinian-Israeli situation. Now, it's a given now that the United States is moving its embassy from Tel Aviv, where I am now, to Jerusalem, and almost every Israeli welcomes that. That's going to happen next month. But after that, is it true that there will be a White House peace plan for Israelis and Palestinians? Will President Trump feel that maybe he has to twist Israel's arm to get the Netanyahu government to do something that it wouldn't otherwise do? Uh, frankly, Israelis are wondering about that. And what about Syria? There's a civil war just to the northeast of this country, and the U.S. is speaking about pulling its 2,000 troops out. Israel is concerned that would create a vacuum, and Iran might fill that vacuum. Now, Israelis know that President Trump is absolutely opposed to Iran, but he wants to get out of Syria, maybe for domestic political reasons, and the Israelis feel they have to figure that out. Another issue, the Iran nuclear deal. President Trump has said that it's the worst deal ever, but Israel wants to know, will he really next month tear it up, walk away from it? Maybe he'll succeed in getting America's partners in Europe, Britain, France, and Germany to change the deal so it won't expire or sunset in about a decade? Again, a big question mark for for the Israelis. Those aren't the only questions, and frankly, like everyone on Earth, Israelis are wondering what Donald Trump will do next. Again, Israelis feel that he's pro-Israel, but they do wonder, what will he do? And from Tel Aviv, back to you in New York. Many questions there, many questions here. In the middle of all of this, we're also learning that a phone call between Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Trump grew tense over the president's desire to leave Syria. Yeah, Mr. Netanyahu is reportedly upset about the president's plan to try and pull out of Syria within six months. According to the report from Israeli media, Prime Minister Netanyahu told President Trump that he's especially worried about Iran's presence in Syria. President Trump has repeatedly expressed his desire to pull out of Syria as soon as the last pockets of Islamic State have been defeated. And another issue causing tension in Israel is the new round of protests of Palestinians uh, they're planning in Gaza tomorrow. Yeah, dozens of people were out on the streets today in Gaza preparing near the border. Protesters made makeshift rock and projectiles and they gathered hundreds of tires. They planned to burn thousands of them in order to create a black smoke screen that will pr perhaps protect them from Israeli snipers. At least one person was killed on this day ahead of the new protests. Israel's military has issued a warning to Hamas and said they will not allow things to get out of control like last weekend when 19 people were killed. The protesters say they are prepared for anything. Whatever happens, happens. Whatever God has written for us will happen. We move forward. This is our right, our country. He has taken over my home, so I am entering my home and I am not afraid of anything such as death or anything else. I have been here camping for the past eight days and I am not afraid if they fire missiles or rockets, nor do I care. Today I will regain my rights with a stone and I will keep throwing stones until I regain my rights and I am not afraid of anything. To further discuss, let's bring in our senior Middle East correspondent Mohammed al Qasim in Jerusalem. Mohammed, over 20 Palestinians were killed over the past week. Do you think that next, the next round we're expected to see tomorrow will be just as lethal as the one we saw last Friday, or that both sides, both the IDF and Hamas, drew certain conclusions from the events? Cal, we could have two different answers to, the, to your question. The first one is 
that neither side, Hamas or the Israeli uh, government or army, uh, is interested in escalating the situation. They both have red lines that they wanted to uh, draw on the, on, on the ground, and that was, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, clear last week in terms of the Israeli army, they wanted to make sure that those demonstrations do not approach and get uh, close to the security fence. And they've uh, made, uh, took every step that they could to do so. Uh, on the other hand, for Hamas, it doesn't want to escalate the situation, but its main goal right now is to attract attention to the uh, situation in Gaza in terms of the humanitarian crisis, as well as uh, the dire uh, economic situation. And given that the reconciliation talks between Hamas and the Fatah movement that, uh, that's in charge of the uh, West Bank hasn't really gone uh, uh, or progressed any further in the last few weeks, that is not uh, a good sign for them. On the other hand, we're expecting about 50,000 demonstrators to show up along the borders tomorrow. That's going to be a huge task. Uh, for the uh, for both sides to keep the crowd peaceful. Hamas said it wants to keep it peaceful, but we've seen more than 20 people get killed. The Israeli army said as long as the protesters stay 700 uh, meters away from the security fence, otherwise they will be, uh, you know, they will take all, all the steps needed to uh, make sure that the borders are uh, secure. So with that many people, with the, uh, you know, tires, in fact, tomorrow, uh, Cal and uh, David, it's, it's depicted as the uh, tire Friday. Uh, there will be more than 15 to 20,000 tires, at least on the borders, that will be burned, and you will, you know, you will, you will see within hours that how uh, the black smoke will cover that area. Uh, so things may go out of hand, and we had about 30,000 demonstrators last week, and we've seen uh, at least 20 uh, Palestinians get killed. Uh, I think tomorrow will be another tense Friday. Mohammed, what's the mood on both the Israeli and the Palestinian side? I mean, given that this will be a mass demonstration, given the number of people, as you point out, who were killed last weekend and the fears that it could grow, is there much anxiety heading into Friday morning? Anxiety and tension is growing. I think both sides are, uh, you know, entrenched in their positions. They're not, uh, they're unwilling to give in to the other side. And I think this will uh, escalate the situation. If, uh, if, if let's see how early the uh, clashes will uh, will start and how uh, you know. Last week we started to hear about uh, Palestinians get shot and killed early in the day, and that's why we had so many uh, Palestinians uh, by the end of the day uh, get killed. And I think tomorrow may be a repeat of, of last Friday's events, maybe even worse if things get out of uh, control early in the day. We're expecting the peak of it to, uh, to start around midday, right after the Friday uh, prayers. But uh, the, the burning of the tires will most definitely start early in the day, uh, within hours from, uh, from now. As soon as the sun rises, we will start seeing that. Both sides are not giving in. Both sides are in challenge mood. And if that continues, then we may see another bloody Friday. Mohammed, you mentioned before that Hamas leaders are interested in attracting attention to the dire humanitarian situation in, in Gaza. But I want to ask you, are they really getting the support they're hoping to get from, you know, um, other Arab countries, maybe even from the West Bank, maybe from even Israeli Arabs? Are they getting the support? Great question, Cal. I don't think that they're getting the, uh, the support that they need from the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah. President Abbas was late coming to the podium last Friday. He, did, he took the podium and gave a, a very weak speech in the eyes of many around uh, 10 o'clock local time. That was hours after the clashes uh, ended last Friday. They're not getting the support that they need even from the Arab world. And we all have spent a lot of time speaking and talking and uh, analyzing the uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia's uh, interview to the Atlantic magazine, and that was criticized by Hamas uh, today in a statement. However, Hamas uh, and the Palestinians in Gaza have been getting a lot of traction and support from the Western world, from the uh, NGOs around the, and around the world, but not so much from the uh, Palestinian Authority or even from the U.S. Uh, the United uh, Nations, according to the Palestinians, uh, has uh, you know is under the control of the U.S., so they're not getting much help from there. However, I think Hamas did get uh, succeed in getting the attention that it needs from the from 
from the international community. They're much interested in the Europeans and, uh, and even the, uh, the media around the world, much more than uh, the Arab support. They know that they want, you know, they you know, I've spoken to many of them over the phone in the last few days in Gaza, and they say that they wash their hands from the Arab world and even the Islamic world, and they're not expecting much from Ramallah. And, Mohammed, how is the conflict in Gaza playing across the wider Middle East with some of those countries that, of course, the Saudi Arabian crown prince is here in the United States, but across the region, how is this story playing? There are two different uh, answers to this question, David. On the official level, uh, you see the usual condemnation from the uh, governments, the usual uh, support. However, on the public level, this is something that uh, the Palestinians aren't used to. If, if we go back uh, into uh, the uh, second intifada of 2000 and then the few years after, even if we go back before to the uh, 87 intifada, even to last year, when uh, we had uh, a period of two weeks of uh, demonstrations and sit-ins in Jerusalem over the uh, Haram al-Sharif, uh, as it's known to uh, Muslims, or Temple Mount, as it's known to uh, Jews, they're not getting public support from the Arab streets. Mm. Senior Middle East correspondent Mohammed al Qasim, thank you for these, uh, this interesting reading of the situation there on the Gaza border. It's just, I mean, he always delivers terrific reporting, and it's just, uh, you can feel the anxiety and the tension, even in his voice, from the region. And we're just, again, a few hours away from Friday morning when literally 50,000 people are expected. Many of them perhaps are going to try to breach. more than last Friday, yeah. if I'm not wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, still ahead, the United Nations is promising to crack down on smugglers taking advantage of humanitarian aid shipments to Yemen. This comes with its new questions about how much of the aid promised to civilians is actually making it to those who need it. Yemen is the poorest country in the Middle East. There has been a war there for three years, and the United Nations now says that it will try to step up inspections of ships that are bringing humanitarian aid to the people who are caught up in the conflict. This is to ensure no military items are being smuggled in and to speed the delivery of the supplies. Several countries have pledged billions of dollars in aid to help the people of Yemen caught in the conflict. But there are ethical concerns about just where some of the money is coming from and how it's being used. Senior diplomatic correspondent Nina Larson has the details. Geneva, Tuesday, $2 billion for Yemen. It is my pleasure to announce that uh, this pledging conference represents a remarkable success of international solidarity to the people of Yemen. New York, just a week ago, $1 billion for Yemen. The amounts are staggering, but this is not the first time the suffering of Yemen have been offered the world's help. But how does aid pass through a violent civil war and the airstrikes and missiles of a proxy war to reach the victims of violence, famine and cholera, especially if those offering the help are making matters worse? Probably from the Saudis it may have been sincere, but it has so many limitations on it that its ability to really address the humanitarian crisis is going to be extremely limited and has been discounted by a number of the major international aid organizations. In the beginning, I think there was an assumption that the Saudis were hitting civilian targets like schools and hospitals uh, by accident. Um, after three years, I think there is a growing concern that, that these institutions um, are being hit on purpose. And their adversary, Iran, is using Yemen's ports for anything but aid. Former UK Foreign Minister David Miliband heads International Rescue, one of the few NGOs to operate in Yemen. To travel from Aden to Sana'a, which many of you will know is a distance of about 300 miles, we have to pass through more than 70 checkpoints. That's an average of one checkpoint every 4.3 miles. It takes my teams three to six weeks of planning and permitting to get one truck on the road from Aden to Sana'a. Miliband knows this kind of crisis firsthand, but has never seen suffering on Yemen's scale. Can you tell me what the most urgent humanitarian need is? The most urgent is obviously the life-saving work. So you've got children dying at such a 
alarming rate. That has to be the priority. We have mobile health teams who try and address those kind of uh, issues. The acute level of suffering that is suffered by some Yemenis is not unique. What is unusual is the fact that it encompasses nearly 80% of the whole country, 22 million people out of 27. In Yemen you have state fragility layered with conflict, layered with long-term climate resource uh, stress, layered with poverty, uh, makes it very, very difficult. The United Nations talks of a peace process, appointing a new envoy, but without safe passage and a conflicted guarantor, the world's forgotten war is far from over. Nina Larson, I-24 News, Washington. Thoughts? Here's a question that people in Yemen have been asking in uh, recent days. Should we take the money? Right. <laughs> the money that comes from the same source of the airstrikes. I think they should. Right. Uh, I mean, when you got so many people who are starving and facing cholera, incredible. I mean, you just deal with the ethical questions later. Save your people first. At least that's that's my thought. It's a good point. Yeah. Coming up, President Trump has now signed the documents to enable the National Guard to be deployed to the U.S. border with Mexico. But he's not the first president to try and do this. Is it an effective strategy, and how will this impact relations? Lots to discuss next. Back. Mexican officials are fighting back after President Trump officially ordered the National Guard to the border. Lawmakers are calling on the Mexican government to retaliate by ending cooperation on security and immigration issues. But Donald Trump is not the first U.S. president to actually send National Guard troops to the U.S.-Mexico border. Similar deployments were also used by both Presidents Bush and Barack Obama. Now it seems the troops will be securing the border, at least until a permanent wall can be built. Serena Marshall has the latest. The president declaring victory on Twitter over stopping migrants traveling in a caravan in Mexico seeking political asylum and stating border crossings are at a still unacceptable 46-year low. Stop drugs. The tweet after he officially approved sending National Guard troops to the border to help stem the flow. All of the numbers are going up, so we are at a crisis point. We'd like to stop it before the numbers get even bigger. Even as crossings ticked up in March, overall they are down in nearly 13 percent compared to last year. But 2017 had the lowest recorded illegal crossings since 1972. And while governors from some border states agree, not everyone is behind the move. The sheriff of a border town in Arizona Arizona is worried. What's happening? Do we have a war with immigrants? And California officials want more details that right now the Department of Defense can't provide. Depending on the situation, it will be dependent, possibly unique from state to state. Which means those that are deployed, like past presidential National Guard deployments, are there for surveillance and support only. As for his border wall, after the president suggested he might try to use Defense Department funds to build it, which would require congressional approval, the White House tried to clarify. We're looking into options for the military to build wall on military installations on the border. Pentagon officials, though, tell ABC News the military doesn't actually own any land on the U.S.-Mexico border. That was Serena Marshall reporting. Meantime, President Trump is sparking controversy once again over his comments about immigrants from Mexico. That's right. In West Virginia this afternoon, he referred to a caravan of Honduran migrants who were making their way through Mexico. And the president, in his remarks today, boasted that nearly three years ago, he says he was right when he described the threat of Mexican rapists. Watch. And remember my opening remarks at Trump Tower when I opened. Everybody said, oh... He was so tough, and I used the word rape. And yesterday it came out where this journey coming up, women are raped at levels that nobody's ever seen before. They don't want to mention that. Let's bring in Democratic strategist Hamza Khan and conservative radio host David Zier, who joins us here on set. David, as I recall, three years ago, the president said that Mexico is giving us their rapists. In other words, the people who are crossing the border are rapists. Here, he was talking about people who are trying to cross the border who are being victimized and by are. rapists in Mexico. But 
Those are two different things, right? Sure. So you can't boast that you were right from the beginning when what you're saying now is totally different. Listen, he was inferring uh, three years ago about the uh, evident crime problem that happens with illegal immigration in the United States. You know, while and he was saying that there are rapists that come, do come across along with other criminals. He was not saying that all immigrants who come, illegal immigrants who come into this country were rapists. But today he was saying that these people who are in Mexico from yes. Honduras because they are being raped in Mexico, and they and are. therefore they are but that's different from saying that people who cross the border from Mexico so I don't the think United that States are rapists. really be the focus I mean the focus of this problem is that you know you have a thousand illegal immigrants coming towards the United States Mexico has stricter immigration laws than the United States I can't go into Mexico and stay there they throw me out so I think he's addressing a bigger problem he's not afraid to speak off the cuff it's not a totus he's not the teleprompter of the United States you know, uh, sometimes what he says, you know, can be misconstrued a little bit. but Because his, it's inconsistent. Well, it's not inconsistent when he's sending the National Guard there and he's going to be, you know, correcting the problem. You know, apprehensions at the border were up 47 percent from last month to March, from February to March in the United States. He is addressing the problem. Illegal immigration and illegal crossings are down about 60, 70 percent since he's president. And, uh, you know, Obama deported two million people. So, you know, so, there's a double standard here in judging him, I think. So if border crossing numbers have been decreasing, why deploying the National Guard? Now, Hamza, I want to ask your thoughts uh, on this and also about the president rhetoric. Let's start with the president's rhetoric for a second here, number one, Tal. First of all, this is clearly a racist, bigoted bully who we have in the White House right now who has so no ridiculous. idea what he's doing when it comes to treating people with respect. Yeah, it is ridiculous. I agree with the Republican guest. I don't he's know not why a racist. we elected this man. Oh, you're, wait, you're, you're saying that is absurd. Let's, he is a racist. Call the National Diversity he's absolutely Coalition. A racist, see what they think about him being a racist. Once. You know, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's move on, though, to, a, to the greater point here, which comes down to your, your guest doesn't seem to know his facts very well. Yeah. Americans cross every day into Mexico. No one is thrown out of that country. We have a, a visa agreement with that country for Americans to go back and forth, so I'm not sure what he's talking about You live there. in an alternate Separately, universe. The point, the Fed, the, the po de deploying our National Guard resources to be on the border with Mexico would violate, if you ask me, posse comitatus, which would mean yeah. that we'd be essentially using military force uh, against uh, against against the law, against congressional mandate for civilian purposes. That's and an incorrect that. interpretation of, of posse comitatus. But if this president, if this president wants to go off into war with Mexico, that seems that to be what he wants to do. That's a different story altogether. Those troops Either are way, not allowed to detain or We're practice winning. migration We're law. Well, let, 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 let's, let's. They're there for We're surveillance. Winning. We're winning. This. Here. We're winning and in support. In, you would you would acknowledge, David, that. President Trump is not doing anything different than President Obama and President Bush. In sure. fact, the numbers he's talking about are fewer National Guard yeah. troops. So why should we give the president